Thank you for being here again this morning. I hope you had a wonderful Thanksgiving. At the Lundy household, we got to use four placemats all weekend, which makes it a rare but fantastic weekend. We also received the note from Tim that had that small sample of names of folks that we've lost, family members, friends um, that we've lost due to COVID. And on that list was Craig Wooten and uh, he was a member of the youth group when I was when I was a little young and he was a little older, but he was he was a his kind, his family was so special to Broken Arrow. James was an elder. Uh and Craig specifically, I remember when Colin was little, would come running over to high five and see how he was doing, and it was always a highlight. And I want to offer my condolences to Lori and Tracy because it's a it's a great loss. Um, that, that there was a second loss this weekend that's not on the list, and that was my my most colorful favorite uncle, uh, my great uncle Raymond Bowline, and I, I call him my most colorful great uncle, which is no easy feat because my great uncles all found a way to be the life of the party, uh, and. Uncle Raymond was, he was special. Uh, the last time I saw him was at Bella Rose and he and my Aunt Billy were, were living there and they came to one of the worships that our life group was offering. And I was giving the lesson and to nobody's surprise, I was telling a story and it was about, about Uncle Raymond and he could barely contain himself. He wanted to finish the story for me so badly, but, but he let me offer the story. And it was about his mom getting stung at a 4th of July party up at the Bowline Hill. And he searched out that wasp nest and found it in his bass boat. And we learned a very valuable lesson, lesson that Independence Day that even if you have good intentions and you're avenging your mom, it's still a bad idea to burn out a wasp nest on a boat next to the fuel line. So to his credit, we will always remember the year we celebrated the founding of our great nation with not just fireworks, but also with the boat bonfire. Um, I'm sorry. I'm not sorry. Nostalgia is, is important. History is important. And we can learn a lot of valuable lessons uh, from our, our history from, you know, history is given to us so that we can learn, so that we can repeat the things that work and we can not repeat the things that didn't. We don't want to repeat failures. If we don't learn, then we won't improve. And, you know, there's some things that are positive, kindness, encouragement, like the Wootens. That's the do's. And then there's the things that we don't want to repeat, like burning up a boat. That's the don'ts. So this week, we are going to talk a little bit about history, some do's and some don'ts. And obviously, I'm going to continue this plea for additional study. This, this lesson series is not intended to tell you what to think. This is intended to spark additional study, additional conversation on some very important topics in, within the church so that the church will not forget God, just as God's people have done century after century. So today, we're going to talk a little bit about balance. And originally, it was going to be about um, Ira North and some of the topics in his book with the same title, Balance. But as the lesson series has gone on, it's become quite clear that there's another aspect of balance that is is important and specifically we need to not be out of balance and we're going to talk a little bit about authority we're going to talk a little bit about love and we're going to talk about unity and studying restoration i, I told you this is a sub-series of restoring the church and a lot of times that's a popular study but i want i want to go on the record i'm not a campbellite i'm not a part of the boston stone the stone campbell movement and ironically i don't think those guys would have been either i think they would have probably found it offensive that time was being spent on them instead or in lieu of teaching the word that's what they wanted to get back to 
the word. And while biographies of men and pictures of homes and churches and gravestones, it might be interesting, but studying them is not going to fulfill Paul's words to Timothy in 2 Timothy 4. I charge you in the presence of God and of God, of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with the complete patience and teaching. And, and in Romans 10, verse 17, so faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. We're not going to get these things by studying or being a part of a, a, a Campbell movement. We're going to be able to be lights only when we are hearing the word of God, teaching the word of God, showing the word of God, being an authentic Christian in our walk. So instead of studying the, these aspects of restoration history that we get a lot of, we really do have something we can learn from it. We can learn why was restoration necessary? What was the plea? What was the reaction to it? How did those outside the movement view them, debate them? What happened within the movement? Uh, you know, what caused resulting divisions? If we can learn from these things, it will help us make sure that the bad doesn't happen again and the good can continue so that we, we won't forget God, so that we'll remember God into the next century, into the next millennial, um, millennium, so that our kids won't forget. Basically, we should be studying God's word so that we will know what it means when Satan says, hey, Jerry, watch this. Now, unfortunately, it's been a lack of study of these things that's kept us out of balance and forever in this spiral of forgetting God. So balance, what does it mean? How can we be balanced? Now, understanding that there's an oversimplification of views, there's the crowd that you know, the thus saith the Lord crowd, and then there's the Jesus's love crowd that ultimately works into a tolerance because love is forgiveness, forgiveness is tolerance, tolerance is acceptance. Now, I want you, us to understand right from the beginning that even though biases may lead us to say these are polar opposites, these are not mutually exclusive. Jesus expresses this. He first says, you know, to obey God is to love God, to keep his commands. If you love, you'll keep the commands. He also says in John 13, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I loved you. So love God, you'll keep the commands. You're supposed to love each other. John 13, verse 35, by this all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So Keeping commands is love, and we're supposed to continue to love one another. They're not polar opposites. They're, as we're going to see, very inclusive, because one can't occur without the other if we're going to be authentic and balanced in our walk with Christ. So we can't allow our biases to get in the way. We have to we have to view this sort of like a simple algebraic equation. Look at it this way. If you've got Bible authority without love, that's going to equal division, which, by the way, love minus biblical authority will equal division. And, and one better, biblical authority without love and vice versa equals Satan. Satan's distractions are what maintains these biases to the point to where we can't show the unity that Christ called for. We have to be authentic Christians. We have to keep the commands while loving our neighbors. We can't become stumbling blocks just because we're keeping commands. We can't become stumbling blocks just because we want to show love. We have to make these two ideas one so that we can keep the commands and love Christ and one another. Authenticity. How can we keep the commands without loving? And how can you love without keeping the commands? John 14. 
If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be within you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you yet a little while, and the world will see me no more, but you will see me, because I live, you also will live. In that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? And Jesus answered him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words, and the word that you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. So we need to explore this. We need to explore the purpose for these things that we do. Biblical authority is important, and we don't talk about it enough. It's been it's been a decade since I can remember a, a sermon on it. Um, I can't remember many classes, if any, on it. Biblical authority is the basis by which we act as a congregation. If we believe that we can, you know, come up with this stuff ourselves, where do we come up with that? What basis? Is it going to be objective or is it going to be subjective? So we need to explore some things. Here at Broken Arrow, we should be exploring the purpose for the things that we do as a congregation. We also need to ask, where did we get the authority to do it? And are we getting the desired results? And are we being authentic in our Christian walk? Why don't we get these lessons? Why is it hard to get these lessons? And it's not, it's not just in Broken Arrow. It's hard to get these lessons anywhere today. Why? Why is biblical authority or silence of the scriptures or doctrinal issues, and, and when I say doctrine, I mean actually what it means, biblical beliefs based on an objective biblical standard, not, not some other um, derivative that says that um, something different, but biblical beliefs, that's doctrine, and it's not a dirty word, and I'm sorry that it's gotten there in some circles. We'll talk about that in just a second, but but we've allowed we've allowed folks to frame the conversation, and that's why these things are considered dirty words. This is why if you say one word, it automatically will paint a picture for the listener if they maintain a bias. So we don't want to allow this. We, we can't let this spin happen. It's, it's, it's important that we not allow the, the stumbling block created by these biases. Um, Daniel King, one of the authors of The Simple Pattern, spoke of this when he said, they have become so inherently cynical about anything they consider to be Church of Christ tradition that they represent a genuine threat to sound doctrine, 1 Timothy 1.10, um, 2 Timothy 4.3, uh, among God's people, both now and the future. So he's saying that He's saying that if you say that it's the Church of Christ, it already has a bad taste in some people's mouth. And that bias is a hindrance to good, sound doctrine. It's a threat among God's people for the future and the present. And, you know, I've, I'll tell you, I've heard that excuse right here in this building, right here in this, these classrooms. And it's, it's wrong. It's wrong to allow these biases to have such a heavy-handed influence. And, and it's, it's, it's a two-way street. We have some blame within the church, for sure. Uh, how did it happen? Number one, the blame right here, because we're not authentic. We don't imitate Christ properly at times. It's, sometimes it's human nature to just want to be right. 
And in being right, we become a stumbling block because we have a non-Christian attitude about us. I mean, it's not okay to go tell somebody that they're wrong without showing love. You know, if, if, if we're willing to correct, it needs to be out of love and not out of just the sheer desire to correct. We cannot be stumbling blocks. The commands cannot be a stumbling blocks and only we as, as imperfect human beings can we make the word stumbling blocks for our brothers and sisters. But number two, and, and this is something that I've already alluded to, think Pavlov's dog and the conditioning experiment. And if you didn't get that in, if you didn't get that in psychology, think of Jim's conditioning experiment with Dwight from the office. And, and this is how it gets to the point to where doctrine becomes a dirty word. Let's do a quick uh, word association game. Hopefully this will get my point across. If I say mask, what do you think? Well, some might think medical tool. Others will think snake oil or, or some, some liberty that's being taken away. How do we get there? How do we get there? It's, it's our bias. It's, it's what we've placed in our minds. It's what we've distracted ourselves with. We see things differently because we have allowed it to happen. And we've allowed the same kind of things to happen with our, our, within our studies, within our classes. You can't say certain words or phrases without offending people. And to me, that's crazy. And it's happened because it's been conditioned that way. Think Bible authority, legalist, doctrine, Pharisee, pattern, rigid, musical instrument, heaven and hell issue, women's role, culture bias, command example, necessary inference, man-made. We've allowed these things to be conditioned to the point to where there is folks out there that these words, these ideas, these topics have been so spun that just saying them can build a wall greater than the Romans, the Chinese, or Donald Trump could ever imagine because it's been conditioned that way. We've allowed these educational institutions, we've allowed uh, teachers, um, authors, de denominational writers, popular writers, folks that don't see biblical authority the same way as what the Bible describes even. And we've allowed these people to change and influence very important things that we need to, you know, be aware of and to be a study. If, if we disregard these things that I just talked about, well, what are our kids going to think when, when these issues come up? I mean, why not care about, I mean, why care about these things if they don't even study it? If it's not important enough to raise, it's, there's no difference. Um, there's no difference in a, a, a being, uh, let's, let's just, if there is a wall like what would be built immediately in certain circles, if these words were thrown out, these topics, these um, ideas, if the wall's thrown up and a wall's between us, that's division. If we've lost balance, if we can't find a common ground within Christ, within the word, we are divided. And that is one thing that Christ does not want. He does not want us to be dividers. God did not call teachers to be avoiders or dividers. He called us to teach his word with love and humility so that all those around can know what, what we are, that we are God's family. And we have an inheritance that's shared. It's not, it's not just for me. It's for everybody. And we cannot avoid and divide and keep that inheritance from people. It's, it is 
not being a Christian. It's not being authentic. It is being worldly and it is allowing Satan to distract. And we are, we are following the, the, Hey, Hey, Jerry, watch this and not learning from it. As mentioned before, we should devote a lot of study to biblical, biblical authority and silence of the scriptures. And, and instead of splitting churches, we should be unifying in the word and the deed. The, you know, in the simple pattern, Daniel King explains it this way. He says, little did most of us know that modern, modernity would spell the relinquishment and repudiation of most everything we have believed to be true and held to be sacred by a certain element of the new generation of preachers. Apparently, one of two things has happened while we have been busily engaged in evangelism, church building, and battling back the trends of modernism and liberalism. Some of us have neglected to educate or else have failed in our efforts to educate the oncoming generation regarding who we are and where we've come from or else a frightening, frighteningly large element of the new generation has simply rejected wholesale our identity as an undenominational, non-sectarian, and biblically-centered fellowship of Christians. Make no mistake about it. That is precisely what is at stake when the matter of scriptural authority and how it is established and applied is up for grabs. So, so much division caused by this argument. So much division because we cannot face God's own words that he says so plainly. He, he didn't mince words. It should be an easy thing to grasp. But when Satan's biases get in the way, we lose sight of God. Now, Stafford North, um, he helps with some of this point about how God tells us pretty plainly about keeping commands and, and following the biblical authority. And he was, he was a, a lecturer, uh, basically de not debating, but give, presenting counterpoints to a book that uh, was being presented as a Christ-only new hermeneutic, if, if you will. And he said, first, Jesus says, we must keep his commandments. If you love me, you will keep my commandments, John 14. This statement includes all his commandments. He charged his apostles, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you in Matthew 28. He says, all then Jesus and the apostles have commanded is important. And we should make every effort to follow all of it. Stafford North points out that these, these things that Jesus and the apostles have said are important. Ignoring them is not anything that Christ has said, exemplified. Uh, there's, there's no basis for it. Um, number, number two. Number two, Jesus and his apostles often help us to know what is essential by connecting the commands either to a promise of eternal life or a warning of eternal destruction. So on one hand, Christ is saying that he and his apostles and what they say and do, it must be followed. Secondly, there are times when Jesus and the apostles spell out specific things that will lead to eternal life or a warning of eternal destruction. Mark 16, verse 16, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. And, and the baptism, and, and next week we'll be talking about worship, so we'll be talking about baptism a little more. It's, it is the baptism of Christ. It is the baptism into Christ. It's, and it is, it is the act by which we are saved. Now, Obviously, grace is what saves us. We don't earn it. Baptism's not a work. But you cannot miss the urgency, the, all the examples of baptism. And, and, and we'll, we'll get into it a lot more next week. But um, Hebrews 11, verse 6, without faith, it is impossible to please God. So baptism, you must have faith. If you're going to please God, those who departed from the revealed way of worshiping in the Lord's Supper were told that they were guilty 
and were eating and drinking damnation or condemnation on themselves in 1 Corinthians 11. Um, so we see these things that are important, that are stated will lead to heaven, that will lead to hell. These things are there. We must act on those things. Uh, so if, if biblical authority wasn't important, these things wouldn't be important. Uh, Re Revelation um, 21, eight, all liars have their part in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone. Um, these are just a few samples and examples. If a promise of heaven or a warning of condemnation is connected to a practice, then surely we're supposed to consider these things as essential, regardless of how close it may, you know, regardless of any bias that we might bring to the conversation. There's no tolerance. There's no tolerance in a statement that Christ makes if he says it's going to lead to this event, or if he says it leads to this event. We don't have the authority or the right to say otherwise, do otherwise, take an approach that will ultimately lead us to otherwise. Third, Stafford North says, there's a certainty and value in establishing a strong personal relationship with Jesus. I ought to seek to please him with all that I do. And we've already heard he will be pleased. If we love him, we will keep his commands. We must recognize that Christ and his sacrifice is the centerpiece of God's plan of salvation. And it's his love that leads to us following him above our wants and desires. So if we love him, we keep his commands. If he's the centerpiece of our, of our life, he's also the centerpiece of God's plan of salvation. And it's that love that leads us to forego our own desires and wants and needs, our own selfishness, our own subjectivism, and leads us to an objective that he has presented to us. Keep his commands. Show love to him. Fourth, we must seek to determine what doctrines and practices are essential in the Christian faith and thus are vital for us to believe and practice. Now, the apostles were guided into all truth and were told to teach what Christ had commanded. But we must listen to their teachings and we must take their teachings seriously and seek to follow it. If they were given these instructions and these instructions are everything that we need to successfully successfully be authentic in our walk and allow our, uh, ourselves to you know be part of God's family all through God's grace we must take it seriously we can't we can't deny it certainly all of those things to which you know if, if things have a warning, if things are going to uh, take us, allow us to be part of the family, we need to pay attention to these things. If Jesus offered it, if the apostles offered it, if the holy inspired writers offered it, it's important. We can't ignore it. Once we learn the message of God has given us, you know, has given us these lessons, once we understand that those lessons are inspired what more do we need? We must receive it. We must accept it. And we must teach it with humility, with authenticity, and without fear. We can't shirk our responsibility because we're afraid that we're going to offend somebody with God's word. If we approach it with love, with good bedside manner, God's word will win out. It's God's message. It's not the messenger. It's God's message that is, it, it brings those around us to Christ. God's message, not ours. And, you know, Jesus discusses authority in Matthew 21, verses 23 through 27. And when he entered the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came up to him and he was teaching and said, 
by what authority are you doing these things? And you gave, and who gave you this authority? And Jesus answered them, I'll ask you one question. And if you tell me the answer, then I also will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, from where did it come? From heaven or from man? And they discussed it amongst themselves and said, if we say from heaven, he will say to us, why then did you not believe him? But if he says from man, we are afraid of the crowd, for they all hold that John was a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we do not know. And he said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. So in his response to the Jewish leaders, he's, he's kind of switching the topics, but he's dealing with the same issue. He's saying, if what they're asking was, was he teaching from heaven or was he teaching from men? What was the source? What was the authority? And what was his response? He asked them about the baptism of John. It, he didn't allow them to con, take this condition distraction, something they probably had used time after time with, with various folks that wanted to teach Jesus. And he reversed the roles on them and said, so what source what was John's baptism? What source was it? Was it from man or was it from heaven? So he avoided this trickery and established this idea. This, he makes legitimate the issue, which is it? Is it from God or is it from man? Had God granted Jesus the authority to teach as he was doing? Of course. Was his message from God? Of course. If it had been from man, it would not have been. If it had been from man, it would not have had the power of God. And we must remember that. We must remember that as we go forward in applying how we do the things that we do, why we do the things that we do for God for those around us, for our members, for our loved ones, for the, the needy. Where do we get the authority to do it? And there is only one place that we can get authority, and that's from God. If we go beyond God's authority, then it is from man. And that's not what we see in the Bible. We must teach heaven's doctrine and exhibit Christ's love if we're going to fulfill the commands and teach and unify the world. Um, I want to close with the, the same closing that Stafford North did in, in the lesson that he was giving. Uh, and he references a story about Jerry Rushford writing uh, about Christians on the Oregon Trail. And he says, many of those who made this journey were members of the churches of Christ. As they got to Oregon, they established churches and thrived. By 1871, they had more members than any other religion in that area with over 3,500 members. By the 1880s, however, some among them said that they had been too narrow. They needed to change in their worship. They should be less isolated and take part in interfaith meetings. Some agreed and some disagreed. The result was division and both sides declined. Within 30 years, the non-instrumental churches were down to a third of their former members. Let's work to avoid such a situation in our time. Let's stand firm on the truths that can be known from Scripture. Like first century Christians, let's proclaim God's plan of salvation to all who have not obeyed. Let's demonstrate to the world that it is possible for the church that Jesus built in the first century to exist today. May God bless us to this end. Thank you so very much again for being a part of this lesson series. Please share any thoughts. Please, I, I encourage you to have the additional study. And I, I encourage you to be a part of the solution and not be a part of the problem. Thank you and have a great rest of the weekend.